February 13th, 2013, the 55th annual running of the Great American Race, the Daytona 500. This race in particular is marked with a ton of anticipation for various reasons, but what ended up happening was a race that was so dull and so lifeless that it gave the 2000 Daytona 500 a run for its money. We're gonna try to see if we can talk to her. Of course, 50 Cent here. I gotta go talk to Danica Patrick. Good to see you. What are you doing here? I'm enjoying myself. I'm enjoying all the festivities while we roll. That awkward embrace should have told us that this wasn't gonna be good. This is the second worst Daytona 500. All the talk during the 2012 offseason was the debut of the new Generation 6 car. This was supposed to put the stock back in stock car racing. And it was perfect that Brad Keselowski, Jimmy Johnson, and Clint Boyer just so happened to be the top three in points, showing off all three manufacturers. A lot of testing was done during the 2012 offseason as well as during preseason thunder. The first official race of the Gen 6 car took place during the 2013 Sprint Unlimited. The aim of the Gen 6 was to improve mid-race competition on intermediate tracks and bring back pack racing full force as opposed to two-car tandems at Daytona and Talladega. Even though the Gen 6 debut had its moments from time to time, the overall racing was pretty dull in my opinion. I remember just being so boarded out within the final 10 laps, and all I could reminisce about was how good the pack racing was the year prior. In the end, Kevin Harvick won the first ever race for the Gen 6 car, and the following day was marked by a historic event with Danica Patrick becoming the first ever female driver to take the pole in the Great American Race. This was obviously gonna bring in a lot more of the casual viewer base in particular, and the previous season's Daytona 500 on its own brought in a lot of hype as well. Unfortunately, there was a bit of a dark cloud heading into that season's race. Kyle Larson's car had gone airborne and into the catch fence in the previous day's Nationwide Series opener. In total, 28 fans were injured, with two of them being in critical condition. Much of the tragedy was due to the car hitting a cross over gate in the catch fence. Thankfully, no fatalities occurred on the racetrack or in the grandstands, and Daytona International Speedway was able to make the necessary repairs in time for the 55th annual Daytona 500 to commence. During the pre-race, Michael Waltrip had stated that we're gonna see three wide racing. And we did, initially. The initial laps provided some spectacular racing. Not only were we seeing side-by-side -side pack racing in the 500 once again, but the early laps also featured some spectacular three-wide action. Then all of a sudden, every driver in the field began to hop aboard. 10 laps complete. Jeff Gordon's number 24 Chevrolet leads the way. He has now led more Daytona 500s than any driver, with the exception of Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt. And when I say hop aboard, I mean hop aboard the choo-choo. Yeah, that's right. All of this train racing began to take place, and by the time the first caution came out, the only action we had seen was Kyle Busch's spectacular pass in the grass on pit road. Restarting on the outside was going to be key in winning the race. The Gen 6 was notably faster on the top side, but also during this we saw our first wreck of the day. Oh Kane! Kane gets around! Slides across the track! Dylan misses him! More carnage down toward turn number one, Montoya, Harvick. A real low apron. All with damage as the caution comes out. But always remember this, just because you have a few wrecks in a race doesn't make it great racing. I mean, look at this camera view. I know Clint Boyer is going damn near 200 miles per hour, but at the same time, just being able to run the top has to be extremely boring, no matter what speed it is. And this was basically the first half of the race in a nutshell. Nobody could pass at all unless you were on pit road. At this point, there's no need to go over the nuances of side drafting. A, we haven't seen that in the race, and B, at this point the casual viewer has probably changed the channel. They tuned back in for a brief moment to see Danica Patrick become the first female driver to ever lead a lap under green in the Great American Race, then immediately change the channel as soon as Kenseth takes the lead. On what universe would anyone consider this type of racing entertaining? Yeah, those six Toyota drivers, remember, they were some oh, of the troubles first... turn one, guys. One car down, spinning, Trevor Bain up to the wall, collects another, that is Carl Edwards. 
the fifth wreck that Edwards has been involved in this spring. The 34 of David Reagan involved, and that's the 35 of Riverside, California's Josh Wise. We're under caution for the fourth time today. If the only reason you're watching the race is hoping a wreck happens, I don't blame you at this point. Like I said, this doesn't equate to good racing, but at the same time, it's better than seeing the choo-choo going on on the outside. But hey, it's not all gloom and doom. At least we got to see the downfall of Toyota Racing. Whoa, because the bottom happened happened Kansas. Kansas car is smoking I now. I saw that earlier going into turn three, Larry. I know there was speed. He's back What's in up? line. He just said something about... Uh, a little bit of blue smoke came out the left front. Well, Matt Kansas is making this look easy, but it is not easy. He is talking about another vibration. He just came on the radio before we saw that smoke and said, I feel it vibrating again. Yeah, he's got some kind of issue with something in the front end. I'm not sure what it is, but that car is going to have to come to pit road. That's they told him, buddy. It's, it's, a, it's a gear or something. It's uh, shaking in the shifter real bad. It's a gear transmission or something. That was Matt Kansas' big vibration on Toyota number 20. But his two Joe Gibbs teammates are now one two. Denny Hamlet and Kyle Busch has worked his way back to the front. If I give you fuel only, would you be okay with that? He said 10-4. And Something here comes Kyle Busch to pit road. He just, he just started smoking. Kansas teammate is on pit road. Kyle Busch, who has not led today. He's run as high as second. Krista, his looks different. It's coming out the exhaust pipe. Yeah, completely different situations. He's talking about it blowing up. Matt Kenseth knows it was something with the drivetrain because he said when he put it in neutral, it stopped shaking. It isn't shaking so bad he couldn't see. Right now, they're trying to figure out what's wrong with his teammate, Kyle Busch. Three of the top four running Toyotas in the field were gone in an instant. Denny Hamlin was their only hope at winning that season's 500, but a late race caution during green flag pit stops involving Jeff Burton would reshuffle the field. Brad Keselowski just so happened to restart on the outside, therefore he got the lead. But then a later caution came out within the final 10 laps, Jimmy Johnson happened to be right on the outside and ended up taking the lead. It's that simple. Daryl, keep an eye on Daryl. Oh, car in the wall, hard. Turn one. And it's one of the BK cars. It's the 93 of Travis Quapple. Let me know if no caution. NASCAR, if the track is clear, they will let them finish. We are still green. Here and here come Dale the leaders. Jr. Yeah, Mark Martin is really pushing Dale Earnhardt Jr. in that 88. Junior to the inside of Greg Biffle. The green flag still flies. Martin's number 55. Keslowski in the two. Biffle backing up. Patrick behind him. For the second time, the Daytona 500 goes to Jimmy Johnson, five-time champion from Oklahoma, California, and his Rick Hendricks Chevrolet. He can take, he can take Dale Jr. for that. Second year in Dale Jr. Even the last lap finish was extremely frustrating to watch. Junior clearly had a run, but couldn't make the pass. In the end, Jimmy Johnson won his second and final Daytona 500, while the Gen 6 was heavily criticized at the conclusion of the race. This race had a ton of hype leading into it, but all came to a whopping flop. I never saw the 2000 Daytona 500, but the 2013 Daytona 500 is without a doubt the worst Daytona 500 I've ever personally seen. Living up to the 2012 one was going to be a tall order to ask of anybody, but at the same time, I expected this race to be so much better. But I'm still of the opinion that the 2000 Daytona 500 is without a doubt the worst in history, with the 2013 one one coming a distant second. Oh yeah, the Harlem Shake. Never mind, a close second. And once again, that'll do it for another video. Thank you guys so much for watching. This is Black Flags Matter. Catch you next time.